Hello again, everybody. We're going to talk here about biliary metabolism. Now, this kind of piggybacks off the talk that I gave on cholesterol synthesis because this pathway is an important place where cholesterol goes. It's one of the ways that we use cholesterol. Now, other places we use cholesterol is that we insert it on the cell membrane to make the cell more fluid. We also use it in steroid metabolism or steroid synthesis, rather. Uh, so there's a variety of places where cholesterol can go, and this is one of them. Now, we're going to focus in, and what I want you to really take from this talk is where certain drugs interfere with this pathway and where you can get disease and why the diseases cause the manifestations that they do. All right, so let's start out with our pathway here. I accidentally wrote it in here. I probably shouldn't have done that. Keep this a surprise. All right. Uh, so we start out with cholesterol. And cholesterol is the precursor for bile salts and bile acids. The first thing we do is we convert this into something called a cholic acid. Now, cholic acid is one of the cholic acids. The other is called kinodeoxycholic acid. Do not worry about that. Just know that cholesterol gets converted into something called a cholic acid. And the enzyme that's responsible for this is called cholesterol 7-alpha hydroxylase. Now this is an important enzyme to know, and it's really the only enzyme that you need to know in this entire pathway, in this entire talk, because this is the rate limiting step. It's also featured in one of the, you may say, adverse effects of a particular drug. And that drug is a class called fibrates. Now you've probably heard of fibrates. Fibrates are used particularly to decrease triglycerides in the blood. And they work by uh, upregulating, activating something called PPAR alpha. That's something you'll want to know for your exam. PPAR alpha, associate those two words. Now, PPAR alpha, when it's upregulated, it's going to increase enzymes that are responsible for uh, the oxidation of fatty acids. Now, another thing that it does is at a transcriptional level, so we're not talking about enzyme inhibition here, at a transcriptional level, it decreases the amount of cholesterol 7-alpha hydroxylase. Consequently, cholesterol can build up and it can go into the bile. Now, this is a problem because in the bile, you have a fine-tuned balance between cholesterol and uh, bile acids. And if you disturb that balance, you can cause a supersaturation and thus stones. And so what kind of stones are you going to increase the risk of with fibrate therapy? Cholesterol stones. Because you're going to have an increased amount, cholesterol, an increased amount relatively of cholesterol in the bile. So one of the adverse effects of fibrates is cholesterol stones, and it is due to decreased amount of cholesterol 7-alpha hydroxylase, and that is fair game on your exam. Now you might think, well, why would I wanna use fibrates if a patient has a disturbed cholesterol panel? Wouldn't that increase cholesterol? And it is true at this point, it would increase cholesterol, but PPAR alpha does a lot of things, and uh, one of the things that it does when it's induced is it increases lipoprotein lipase. And so that's going to have an effect of actually, in total, slightly reducing your LDL. But it has more of an effect on VLDL by hydrolyzing VLDL and on chylomicrons, and that's going to result more so in a decrease in triglycerides and a decrease in VLDL. So if you have a patient with an elevated LDL, you don't want to jump on fibrates for that particular kind of panel. You would rather go towards the statins. Uh, but fibrates, uh, this is where it works, and it's important that you understand that. Now, what are some examples of fibrates? Gemfibrazil and phenofibrate. Those are the two you'll want to know for your exam. Okay, so what next? Well, cholic acids are conjugated. 
So cholic acids are known as primary biliary acids, and they are conjugated with glycine and taurine, one or the other. And when that happens, they are now bile salts. And bile salts will then go into the biliary tract. Now, everything we've talked about up until this point takes place in the hepatocyte. Bile salts are then excreted from the hepatocyte and goes into the biliary tract. It can be stored in the gallbladder or it can just go straight into the biliary tract. And ultimately, it's going to reach the small intestine. Now, the place where we're going to see that these uh, bile salts primarily work is in the ileum, but as you know, the sphincter of Odi and all that where the bile comes out is actually much higher up in the small intestine. Uh, you're talking, you know, in the duodenum, okay? So this is where bile salts work though, in the ileum, and that's gonna be important in a little bit as we'll see. So bile salts, do their thing uh, in the small intestine, and primarily they work uh, through emulsification and absorption of lipids. Uh, so that's, that's how they work. It's not so much the bile acids that are going to do this, uh, it's the bile salts, and that's just due to their ability to be ampopathic. Okay, so bacteria in the ileum will ultimately deconjugate your bile salts. And so glycine and taurine come off, and now you're left with bile acids again. Now these are different from the bile acids that are in the hepatocytes. These are secondary bile acids. Okay, now secondary bile acids, about 95% are reabsorbed into the portal circulation. We call this the enterohepatic circulation and they'll make their way back to the liver, so they're recycled. That's 95%. The other 5% go out the stool. Okay, so that's the pathway, that's it. What you need to know is that you're starting with cholesterol. Cholesterol 7-alpha hydroxylase is the rate-limiting step, and it is affected by fibrates that bile salts go into the small intestine, they're deconjugated by bacteria, they're reabsorbed as bile acids, as secondary bile acids, and 95% is reabsorbed. All right, now let's start talking about the fun stuff. Let's talk about disease. So one of the places where you can have disease is right here in the biliary tract. And when this happens, we call this cholestasis. So what's happening is that you can get inflammation or fibrosis of the biliary tract, and that's going to decrease the amount of bile salts that make it into the small intestine. So that can result in, uh, in steatorrhea, in poor fat absorption, etc. Uh, but one of the places where they like to ask you about this is, okay, you've got a patient with cholestasis and you know, you've got all the typical symptoms of cholestasis like jaundice and itching. Well, why? Well, if you have itching or pruritus, that is due to increased bile acids in the blood. So it is not due to increased bilirubin, it's due to increased bile acids. That's what causes the itching. Now indeed, you do have increased bilirubin, and that is what causes jaundice. So it's important to distinguish the two of them because a lot of times students will think that it's the yellowness of the skin that's causing the itching, and that's not true. So what causes cholestasis? Two things classically, there are a lot but primary biliary cirrhosis and primary sclerosis and cholangitis. All right, what's next? Crohn's disease. Now that's interesting. Well, you know that Crohn's disease really likes to affect the ileum, Crohn's ileitis. And so if you have inflammation of the ileum, you're gonna have a hard time reabsorbing bile acids. Now, why is this a problem? Why do I mention this? Well, if you're not reabsorbing bile acids, you're gonna have decreased cholic acids in the biliary tract. And what that means is that you have a relatively high cholesterol level in the biliary tract, in the bile. 
And so, as we saw with fibrates, if you have relatively high cholesterol, you get saturation and you have an increased risk of cholesterol stones. So that is why in patients with Crohn's disease, they are prone to cholesterol stones. All right, how about another drug? We have the bile acid sequestrants. I'm just gonna write BAS here. So some examples of bile acid sequestrants include colstyramine, colcevalam, and colstipol. They all start with col. Now, why would we give these? Well, it makes sense that if we reduce the absorption of bile acids, then we're going to need to make new cholic acids in order to replenish because we're not recycling as well. And what do we make them out of? We make them out of cholesterol. So the liver has got to use cholesterol. And if it's using more cholesterol, then it needs to bring in more cholesterol. And so if it's bringing in more cholesterol, it's getting it from the blood. And if it gets it from the blood, then you know that you decrease LDL because remember that the liver has LDL receptors. That's how it gets cholesterol out of the blood. So it's going to increase the amount of LDL receptors, consequently lowering your LDL levels. And so bile acid sequestrants are good for reducing LDL levels. So that's pretty much everything. So just to recap, you really want to know uh, where these two drugs work and sort of where diseases can happen. So remember that fibrates, uh, while they're really good for reducing triglycerides, they're not as good at reducing LDL because they uh, they cause cholesterol to sort of get backed up due to the unwanted effect of decreasing cholesterol 7-alpha hydroxylase at the transcriptional level. Uh, so they can cause cholesterol stones because cholesterol will be high relative to cholic acids. So cholesterol stones are an adverse effect of fibrates and do associate fibrates with P par alpha. That's a really simple question that they could give you on how fibrates work. Also know that bile acid sequestrants decrease the reabsorption of bile acids and thus necessitate the conversion of cholesterol to cholic acids. The liver is going to pick up more cholesterol from the blood and so bile acid sequestrants are good for reducing LDL. Cholestasis increases bile acids in the blood and it also increases bilirubin in the blood. It's the bile acids that cause pruritus and the bilirubin that causes jaundice. And then finally, with Crohn's disease, this is another question they could ask you, why do you get cholesterol stones with Crohn's disease? And it is because you are not reabsorbing the bile acids, and so you're going to have a relatively high cholesterol level in the bile, and that can supersaturate and, again, cause cholesterol stones.